Welcome to the Drive Able podcast, where we discuss all things about driving and safer community transport for people with disabilities and medical conditions. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to our channel and follow us on the socials. Just search Drive Able Podcast and smash that like button and the subscribe button. We've got heaps of content now, lots of interviews, so make sure you go back and listen to some of our old episodes. G'day, Ali. Hey, Brad. This is a very exciting episode once again. Thanks for joining us. We have a 2021 wheelchair NRL State of Origin rugby player here with us today. Mitchell Stone is going to be full of great lessons. Uh, I've met him personally. He works with Sunrise Medical as a um, consultant there. He's got a great attitude. Um, He's also a driver and regularly commutes all over the city and country for his sports. And we're excited to basically hear about how he does all that and and sort of drives around and travels around and does all of that as well. So, Brad, are you ready for this? Yeah, let's get this underway. Let's get underway. Driving is something many take for granted, but when someone has altered ability, then driving or getting out and about in your own car can be challenging. Driving with a disability doesn't mean you have to drive an old clapped out car with farm-like machinery and relying on a wheelchair doesn't mean waiting for hours and then being in the back of a maxi access cab getting car sick. The Drivable podcast is designed to introduce and explore driving aids for people with disabilities, vehicle modifications, the NDIS, research, medical guidelines, driving techniques and much much more. The Drivable podcast is to help you be informed and be in control of your own independence so you can experience freedom through driving safely and reliably. I'm Ali and with me is Brad and together we have over 30 years of experience in disability and driving. Enough of the intros, let's get into it. Okay, welcome along to Mitchell Stone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Let's kick off first by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your disability, what it actually is and how you came about it. Sure. Um, My name is Mitch. I uh, live in Sydney. I have a T5 paraplegia, which is an an accident um, with a spinal cord at about the the sternum level. Um, How I got that was through a boat accident in 2010 in October. I was on the way home from a football presentation and uh, late at night, about midnight, and didn't see a channel marker, trying to find it with a torch, wasn't able to find it, uh, found it the hard way, and ended up hitting the pole, dislocating a vertebrae at T5 and 6. Um, didn't sever the spinal cord, just a really bad bruise, but made me a complete paraplegic, which means there's no sensation, no movement below that level. Um, and yeah, I was, I was lucky. I stayed inside the boat. I floated around for nine and a half hours. It was raining. It was a Monday, Monday morning by the time people found me. Um, I wasn't expecting to be found. I was between where houses finished. There's about a kilometre of nothing. And then houses start again. I was right in the middle of that. Right. Nobody, got, nobody could see me. Um, and then at about nine o'clock, 9.30 in the morning, I heard a couple of voices tried to yell out. Um, they couldn't hear me, but I was wearing a fluoro jacket. They saw my arm waving out the top of the boat and came over, um, asked if I was all right. I said, oh, I don't, I, I, I think I've broken my back and my arm's not looking real good either. So my arm was snapped at a right angle on my right side. Um, right. I did try and get my phone out of my pocket, out of my right, I was laying on my right side, snapped my right arm and had a broken back, obviously. Um, and tried to get my phone out of my right pocket. When I did finally get my phone out of my right pocket, um, the battery was flat, so I couldn't call for help. <laughs> um, the kayakers yeah. ended up towing me into shore, uh, asked me who I needed to call. I said, can you ring my boss and tell him I'm not coming to work today? <laughs> <laughs> that was your number one phone call, was it? That was my first phone call. And they said, what about your parents? I said, oh, I better give them a call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you got your priorities right as a, as a business owner I like to hear that that's that's excellent <laughs> yeah well, I didn't want to let the boss down <laughs> um, and then yeah so how old were you then? I was 22 22 when that happened um, is it a is it a normal thing to be driving a boat at 12 o'clock like, no, how, so how does that how does that actually happen in the first yeah, place why, why um, yeah 
explain that to me. That's uh, <laughs> there's a bit of a hole there in the story for me. Yeah, sorry, I didn't explain that very well. Um, where I used to live, there's no road to the house, so it was on uh. the water in Warrenora, um, in the in the Sutherland Shire in in Sydney, um, and there was a you park your you park your car and then you jump in your boat and you drive a kilometre to get to the house. Uh, where I played football was also on the water, which is probably about five kilometres from the house. So rather than drive the boat to the car and then around to the football field, I took the boat the whole way. Um, yeah, right. Something I, I did for 10 years, no problems. Um, yeah. Knew, knew the river pretty well. And if I didn't know the river, I probably would have ended up on a sandbar bank rather than into a, a telegraph, like something like a telegraph pole. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, hey, um, there's so many questions to ask about that uh, in regards to your injury later. Um, but what, what happened once you got back to, once you got back to, to shore or the uh, kayakers kind of towed you over, what, what was life like for that initial period for you? Yeah. So they called uh, the emergency services, had all of them turn up. Um, they were discussing a, a helicopter to get to, the airport and then they decided against it because of the weather um, would have been too bumpy so ended up with the police escort um, from uh, Warrenora to Royal North Shore Hospital up in Sydney in North Sydney so it's about an hour hour and a half normally but with the police escort it was a lot quicker um, they called my parents my parents followed that uh, and then a couple of my they called my a couple of my friends they sort of came to see what was happening and saw the police escort and the ambulance and then turned around and followed that too. Um, I had a pretty good group of friends around me when it all happened. So I think that was a massive help getting me through it all. Um, and I had plenty of time to think about it before help arrived as well. So I sort of knew what I was in for uh, from the start. Were you in pain or was it just no feeling? So no feeling from the level of my injury down. Yep. Uh, my arm, it was in agony. Uh, I also broke ribs when I... When I'd had the accident um, and then had mild hypothermia when I ended up at hospital, back in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. How long did you stay in hospital for? I was in hospital for six weeks. Uh, then I went from, from there to rehab, uh, which is normally would be six weeks, but I ended up with a pressure sore, which had me on my stomach for uh, close to six months. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, Where was the rehab? Uh, it was Royal Ride Rehab. Um, so what happened there is I, uh, went away at Christmas time for a holiday that I had booked and I wasn't letting anyone stop me from going on that. <laughs> uh -huh. got, got, got ticked off on everything that they say to get ticked off before you can leave for a uh, weekend leave is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And you can have, uh, up to four or five days. I think it was at the time. Um, so I booked a flight, my mates all drove up. The plan was to drive originally. I booked a flight. They met me at the airport in the Gold Coast. Uh, and then drove me from there to the surfers. Um, we had a New Year's Eve up there as well. So uh, we went to a shooting range and I was at, uh, firing a, a Glock and the shells spat out of the, the Glock and one dropped down my back and I didn't realise because I got no sensation. And burn a hole in my sacrum and then mm. the next few days just sitting on it and laying on it and not realising um, caused a deep pressure sore. Uh, almost down to the bone. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and then because of the lack of sensation, it takes longer to heal, and then you're on your on your stomach for six months. Yeah, well, every time mm. you move and you open it up, it makes it a yeah. longer process to heal. So, laying on your stomach's the best way to get it to heal. So, I was on a prone trolley cruising around the hospital on that for a while. How how was that part of your life? Six months on a on prone on a on a bed on a prone trolley. How how was that? compared to the other areas of your rehab? It sucked. Um, yeah. But I, being on the prone trolley, I, did, I still went and did physio, um, just did a lot of uh, arm, arm and back work, shoulders work. Um, so I had a really nice looking back at the end of it. Yeah, reverse flies, man. You would have been, yeah. uh, those shoulder blades would have looked really, really good. Yeah, very defined. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the people I was in rehab with, I made some good friends uh, in rehab and, and um yeah, they sort of having a laugh and that sort of thing. They they came in into the room. We had shared accommodation, so four people in a room or, or two people by the end of it when we when we swapped around. So you always have someone to talk to, which I think is a, a big thing. Yeah. Um, 
I noticed now they have all single rooms at Royal Rehab. I'm not sure if I like it. I think when I had the shared accommodation, especially for those people that don't have family around, uh, mm. it's nice to have somebody to talk to and somebody who's going through the same thing and knows what you're going through. Um, and you can talk about pretty much everything. There's no no boundaries when you're in there. Yeah, no, you see stuff that, yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't see otherwise, I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah. Speaking look- of, the, of the family side of things, what's... Um- how big is your family and what was what, what did you feel about their involvement in this part when you said you called them? Did they come and yeah. brothers, sisters, do you have many of those? And how so did that I've all work out? An older brother and a younger brother and my mum and dad here. The uh, rest of my family is all in New Zealand. So my parents are both from New Zealand. Um, but yeah, my parents were at the hospital every day. Um, there was a couple of friends that were at the hospital every day as well. Uh, but yeah, I had every day I had a, had a visitor, someone there to... A lot of support behind it, so which is good. So they're doing a three-hour commute every day. Is that right? Hour and a half. Yeah. 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 If there's mm-hmm. nothing else that we've learned along this podcast journey, it's uh, what family do. Um, yeah. We. I'm assuming that your family there were there for you again when you when you got out of hospital, and yes. uh, they did a did a fair bit for you. Yeah. So leaving hospital, um, being that where I lived, there's all by boat to get there. Mm. Yeah, um, it was a three-story house as well. So uh, getting back there was a little bit interesting. Um, made some makeshift ramps and that sort of thing um, to get out of, into and out of the boat. Did your family keep that whole setup? Did, did you guys keep that all set up and you lived around it, or did they? No, so it was just a temporary temporary setup until I could find a place. Trying to get accommodation um, is very difficult when you're in rehab and you and you've done something like that or. It, most people are able to modify their homes fairly easily Um, where my parents lived or where I was living with my parents. um, They, they, it was just too difficult to do permanent modifications uh, and be able to, for it to be practical. So we looked for accommodation, accessible accommodation outside of it and to rent for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, There was nothing, everything that was accessible got snapped up real quick um for for renters um so i ended up moving into a third story unit with one of my mates uh i was in there for nine months but the lift broke down on a weekly basis so oh, right. very good at climbing stairs to get to and from home <laughs> yeah right <laughs> uh, oh, you can leave your wheelchair at the bottom or drag it with you well after a couple of big nights that did happen happened <laughs> i um uh, i yeah uh, was in my bedroom in my room and I wake up in the morning and my chair wasn't there like, what's going on here so i rang my flatmate like, yeah good joke you bring my chair back in you go, oh, don't, don't know what you're talking about he, he'd gone out shopping for the morning or something he goes i don't know what you're talking about i said yeah good one just just bring it in i need it to go to the toilet he goes no nah, don't have it i don't know what you're talking about I was like oh crap like who the hell steals a wheelchair but leaves their phone and the wallet behind? Well, no, not the wallet, the phone and the keys because they're the keys to get in the house. So I end up crawling to the toilet. I went to the toilet and then climbed back in the bed. Like, what the hell? What what's happened? Who's stolen my chair? Yeah. My mate rings me up. He goes, "You're a dickhead." Like, what? He goes, "You've left your chair at the bottom of the stairs." <laughs> I, the, the lift must have broken down. And I've climbed up the stairs, left the chair behind with my wallet in it. It's all still there, said, oh, though. Can you, can it's you all still it there in the morning. Me? That's nice. <laughs> hey, can you bring it up for me? He goes, no, you left it there. Go get it yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> mates, hey, mates. you got to yeah. love mates. Yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, That's what makes you stronger. It is what <laughs> yeah. makes you stronger. When did, when did dr- seeing this as a driving podcast, when did driving come into it? When was that a picture in your mind that it was – something else that you had to do and what we'll do is we'll talk about the boat as well um, yeah, yeah. so when did when did driving a car first of all come back into the picture yeah so in rehab um i started back at work when i was after i'd finished with my pressure sore on my back backside mm-hmm. i started back part-time work at the rsl which is my second job mm-hmm. um before i broke my back they, they did some modifications and ramps there uh so i needed a license to get to and from um, rehab to uh, to work. Yep. Um, so I bought a car in rehab off a guy that was coming in and, and scripting chairs for us, uh, which had modifications like a, a, a push pat uh, mm-hmm. hand control. Um, 
obviously can't just jump straight into a car after you've had an accident and start driving with your hands. You've got to go through all the legalities and OTs and that sort of thing. So I uh, had a session with an OT and a driving instructors. Um, they decided that I needed, I think it was three hours of um, three hours of driving lessons and then had to go and do my P's test again. Never been so nervous to do a test in my life after having driven for I must have been must be six years I think and um, you know having to do it again and not had a problem and you think oh shit I've got all these bad habits I better um, better knock them out and then it was a 15 minute test when I first did it and then it, now it was an hour test I'm like I'm definitely going to end up going over the speed limit or something you know uh, managed to get through it yeah uh, well done congratulations so um, do you still drive with push pat hand controls uh, no, I've got a different mechanism now. I, it's it's like a thumb slide um, to control the accelerator. Yeah, electric electronic um, accelerator, and then the all the hand um, so wipers and high beams and indicators and horn are all mm-hmm. on that hand control and a uh, push to brake. Yep, uh, and, it's a, and it's a PV CT twelve. There you go. <laughs> that, yep. Good product. It's a it's an excellent product. And do you have it on the right hand side where your push pat used to be, or do you have it on the left hand side? No, I have on it on the, the right hand side. On the right hand side. Yep. Yeah. And um, just for uh, to help people understand, um, you slide that with your thumb. Yeah. Is that yes. what you use? Yeah. Um, so you, you kind of like you're sliding your thumb towards your hand. Yeah. Uh, that's to accelerate. It's like clicking a pen. Yeah. yeah like clicking the end of a pen, that's your accelerator. Same type of movement, holding the pen sideways in your hand. And then where your uh, index finger is and your middle finger um, over the back of the hand control, that's where your secondary controls are. Is that right? That's, that's indica- yeah. indicator left and right, windscreen yep. wiper and horn. And and uh, there's also uh, an so extra horns button on the, for- Horns yeah. on the end of, end of the um, end of the knob, which- uh, if you leave the car running and you're transferring out, you can hit with your other leg and then everyone looks at you getting out of the car. So oh, yeah. making, hey, that, making an announcement that you're here. Yeah. 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 Hey, look, everybody, Mitch is here. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's, it's a, it's a great product. Uh, the, the thumb slider, it's, it's something that you can kind of rest on and, um, that thumb movement's usually pretty strong, but as a T12, your arms are not affected. Um, is that, is uh, sorry t5 isn't it t5 injury t5, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do you have any you don't have any uh, impact on your arms or your hands at all at t5? no very lucky um to not have any impact on, on the upper extremities yeah yeah so you're able to do those finer dexterity movements yeah yeah um so getting getting behind the wheel um back behind so you said you're already a driver and getting back behind the wheel so you said you basically just bought the car from one of the other people at the um royal rehab and started learning on that one was that right yeah 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 and was it was it um i guess because you knew how to drive did you find the concept of driving was easy but more just having to just use different parts of your body yeah so because i had a lot of time where i knew my legs weren't working i kind of had to figure out how to that it was going to be all my hands to to do everything so um kind of sat in the car to start off with and got a feel for how the controls worked so down to accelerate and push forwards to brake. Um, and then once we actually started driving, it was a bit a uh, bit, bit like a, your first driving lesson where you bunny hop down the road because you're not, yeah. not sure how sensitive the accelerator is. But mm-hmm. um, once you get a feel for it, it's, it, it gets smoother and smoother. I wonder, yeah. if, um, I wonder if the fact that you um, have a lot of boating experience helps because boats are kind of like hand controls almost. Um, yeah, so so, almost anyway. Yeah, well, motorbikes and boats, um, so very similar with the, the throttle. I, I always used a tiller steer boat, um, which is pushing the motor rather than using a steering wheel on it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's probably more like a motorbike in that aspect where yeah. um, a, a, a center console or a front console boat with a steering wheel and an accelerator might be more close to yeah, the driving yeah. car. Well, that, that was kind of what I was visualizing. Like, you know, the console and then like the, the thing going backwards and forwards and that, that's kind of like, but, but I guess on that boat thing, so did you find, that was one thing I was interested in because you lived somewhere which was accessible by boat, what was your hours on boats compared to hours on, um, like did you spend more time on boats compared to roads? Yeah, I, I 
well, with work, because I had to drive quite a distance for work, I probably spent a fair bit of time there. But I spent a lot of time when I was a kid um, growing up uh, on boats, uh, go water skiing, fishing, all that sort of stuff, all the water sports. Um, so, yeah, probably did spend a lot more time in a boat than, than in the car. And what about now? Do you, I mean, post um, being in a wheelchair, has that, what, what's that done for your boating um, life? A um, little bit different, a little bit more difficult getting in and out of boats. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want another boat. I want a, a bigger boat, um, something I can go do a bit of offshore foot fishing and that sort of thing. Um, but not, not at the top of my priority list at the moment. It's trying to um, sort out a, a house. To, uh, I've bought a house, but maybe looking at buying something else that's more accessible or, or knocking down and rebuilding. So the yeah. boat's getting pushed back. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. No, it's, just, it, it's just interesting because um, it's I guess particularly with NDIS, um, accessible boating is becoming very popular, um, and and it's a bit of a plug, and we're going to have them on. Um, I think one of the guys on there later, uh, PME Problem Management Engineering up the road from us, they're really good at that. Um, they've done a lot of stuff around boating and, and getting people into boats. Um, yeah. and we've done a bit of stuff with them, so it's um and and it's just getting more and more. Um, you know, bigger and bigger. Uh, let's and let's more. ask you that, Mitch. How do you get on and off a boat at the moment? Can you explain that to the listeners for us? Yeah, so it depends on what sort of a boat I go on. Um, mm -hmm. My parents had a barge, so that was quite easy. They were able to set up a ramp. Um, the barge was the same height as the jetty or the pontoon jetty. Uh, so you wheeled straight onto the front of the barge then down the ramp into the barge. Um, when I go outside in my mate's boats, uh, it's a little bit different. I'll there's been a couple of different things I've done. I've, I've used a sports chair when I was in Fiji and took the large wheels off it. So I was seeing all my four casters. Um, that way I had the stability of the, the sports chair and I could push around in any direction on the boat and get around the boat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, transfer out of my boat onto the, the, the gunnels of the boat and then into the next chair. Um, and then when I go on my mate's boats out of Sydney, um, I, ha I leave the chair, my wheelchair behind put it back in the car um i'll get my mates to put it back in the car mm -hmm. i climb onto the side of the boat and then into a seat on the boat as well yep yeah. and, and is it something that you've done uh independently is that something that's achievable yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah and so i always if we're going outside fishing never go on my own always have someone with me but um yeah i've helped reverse the the, the trailer into the or the boat into the water um done it the other way where i've held the boat while they reversed it in mm -hmm. uh, yeah cool. but now so you had to go through licensing for your car yeah did you have to go through any licensing for your boat license no because boats are all controlled <laughs> yeah. by hand yeah, yeah yeah yep that's what i imagined but i just wanted to confirm for and i thought if i had the question maybe other people had the question as well hopefully yeah. no one from uh, maritime is listening to but um Boating is pretty easy to get your license here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really not that well, hard. <laughs> when I did it when I was 12 years old, when I first could get my license, it was a written test and that was it. Yeah. I, I actually did. I also did it when I was 12 years old. And it was, um, I remember it exactly clearly. It was like this circular thing. You circled the multiple choice. Yeah. And the woman just put like this plastic thing over the top and she's like, yeah, you got it right. No, you didn't. And then like, yeah, and you, got, exactly. you got to go like get another go as well. She's like, oh no, you got these ones. I'm going to have another go. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was so cool about it. And so. now, now it's, you've got to go and do, it's kind of like a driving test where you have to drive a boat and show them you're, you're capable of navigating waters and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Which so luckily yeah. they went on that night, I suppose. <laughs> so let's do a bit of um, talking about your extracurricular stuff. Um, so working with Sunrise, um, what do you do there? Yeah, so Sunrise Medical, I work as the RGK um, product specialist for Australia. That's like the so, sports chairs? Uh, no, there's daily end sports chairs, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. anything in their range. Um, I get answers back from, or maybe I know the answers already, but I'll, I'll, uh, if there's something obscure, I'll go to RGK and get answers fairly quickly of whether it can be done or not. Um, yeah, okay. There's been a few few things come through that are, uh, a bit funny where people can't get them on any other chair, um, but there's a possibility on these chairs. Yeah, okay. And do you, um, and how long have you been doing that with Sunrise? Uh, I'll, I've been doing that for eight months or nine months now. 
Um, I was a dealer before dealing with manual high end manual chairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I sort of, they approached me and said, would you be interested in um, doing the higher high end uh, mm-hmm. manual chairs and, and seeing how that goes? Yeah. That sounds pretty good. And, um, and I will just, I guess a little thing on that before we, cause we will stick with the driving. I'll talk about your other stuff as well. Um, any, any, I guess, tips or things that sticks out that people need to consider when they are looking at chairs like that? Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a lead in question to that question. Cause that's a great question, but what do you do with your chair when you get in and out of a car? So what do you do? And then what tips do you have for other people when they're considering a, a chair with maybe a similar injury to yourself? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I will lean my chair on one wheel against the door of the car and pull the wheel off. Uh, and then I grab the back of the chair, lift it forwards and, and put it on the foot plate and lean the backrest against the door and pull the other wheel off mm-hmm. uh, and then pull uh, put the wheels in the back seat. And then I pull the chair across my lap and, in, and put it in the passenger seat of the car unless I have a passenger and then I'll put it in the back uh, of the car, uh, back seat of the car as well. Mm-hmm. Um, normally only takes up, if you wanted to, you could only take, you could take up just a single seat in the car with the whole chair and, and wheels. Yep. Uh, the way these, these chairs are now. And how heavy is your chair? Uh, under four kilos. Yeah. Uh, once, once the wheels are off, it's under four kilos. It's about six kilos with wheels on. Yep. So that makes it, that I'm assuming makes a massive difference, four kilos. That for, for, for that transfer that you do of getting the wheelchair across your body, is that something we're leading into that next question? Is that one of the considerations that you would help somebody consider when yeah, looking at chairs? Sure. Yeah, because um, my last chairs were um, 10 kilos, 12 kilos. Mm. Lifting that across your body, mm-hmm. um, it, it, ha- it does a bit of damage on your shoulders uh, when you're doing it constantly. And I- I'm in and out of the car a lot of- every day um, with my job. So I need something that's going to be- uh, create longevity for my shoulders. So the lighter the chair, um, the better, the better that's going to be for you. Yeah, that's a common thing that we've heard here when the people are kind of like, swinging the chairs in front of them and they end up with these long-term um, shoulder injuries over time. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, it's a really good point keeping at that four kilos is it, that's like, that's really good. Yeah. Um, I mean, you got to, you still got to make sure the chair is going to work for you. Sometimes that, that under four kilo chair may not be the right option. You've got to have the chair that's going to um, do what you need it to do every day. Um, it's not all about getting in and out of the car, um, but you still, yeah, you, you need to be able to push the chair and use the chair in your everyday life. Mm-hmm. Sounds but good. most of the time you can get the right solution with these lightweight chairs. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. All right, well, we might um, talk a little bit about the sports stuff and then start wrapping it up. Um, so tell us about this. Um, so I guess your first story was you were on your way back from footy, was it? Yes. Um, and sounds like you're still into the footy. So, um, so what were you doing before that? Were you like relatively high grade, professional grade? Like what were you playing? Um, no, I just played, just played um, reserve grade footy, club footy uh, okay. and, and a bit of soccer. Uh, but yeah, and, uh, NRL, when I say football. For this, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. If you're listening in South <laughs> Australia, yeah, no, this is being recorded uh, with people in Sydney. We're, we're yeah, talking yeah. about NRL. Thanks very much, Mitch, for clarifying that. <laughs> and then I guess yeah, how keen, like... when you were in the chair, like what got you back into it? Were you super keen to get in or did it just come across? Well, how, did, yeah, how did you find out about it? Yeah, so finding out about it, I when I broke my back, I didn't think there was much out there. I thought maybe there was the basketball. That was probably all I knew. Um, and then the guy I bought the car off actually introduced me into wheelchair rugby league. Uh, and so I said, yeah, okay, I'll get, have a go at that. And he found out that I was a football uh, on the way home from football. And so he said, I'll oh, come have a go. And I went out and I had a go. And my first game, he goes, all right, you're vice captain. I was like, what? <laughs> I've never played this before. He goes, yeah, well, I'm captain, you're vice captain. You know more about this game than anybody else here. So, um, yeah, made me vice captain. And unfortunately, he passed away a few months later. Uh, through cancer and uh, ended up, we ended up winning the season. So dedicated towards him. It's it's run it's it play it's played a lot like the running game. Yeah. Um, so you got the same shape ball. You've got six tackles to tackle. It's kind of like an Oz tag on your on your shoulder. Uh, rip the tag off or flip them out of the chair, and and that's a tackle. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so a bit of fun there, I'm assuming, Mitch. Yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of lot of bang and crash, but uh, not a lot of injuries, which is very surprising. You, you hear a lot of noise, but um, you don't get very many injuries at all. I think in the 11 years I've been there, there might might have been two injuries. And it's, why, it's, why do you think that is? Um, the, the, the design of the chairs, mm-hmm. uh, it keeps all your body parts away from impact. Yeah, okay. Um, so you camber on your wheels. The, the main injuries are when you're on the ground. You get a finger run over or, or something like that. That's, or somebody comes through and, and, and collects you, not me, not purposefully most of the yeah. time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, most of the time when you're in, in the chair upright, the way they're designed, you, your legs are protected by a bar across the front. Uh, the camber on the wheels keeps your hands away from each other's wheels so you're not getting jammed up there. Uh, also gives you a bit of stability to try and keep you on your wheels. Um, and are they just, like 90-minute games as well? Uh, they are 80-minute 80, uh, 80 80 games. Yeah, yeah 40 80, minutes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Wow, that's pretty intense. Freaking yeah. 80 minutes. Yeah. So you're, um, you're probably you're out of it by the end of it. It's probably a pretty hardcore exercise. Yeah, you're getting, getting a good sweat up. It's, um, yeah, it's yeah. good fun. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and do you do any other kind of sports? Yeah, I do a little bit of basketball. I did do a little bit of National League years and years ago. Um, but with work, I got sort of couldn't do the training and then couldn't really commit to um, commit to the sport. But now in my new role, I, I have that option to um, that flexibility with being able to go to the training and, and play the sport. But yeah, COVID's gone and ruined that for us too. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, it kind of could be a good thing for your role because it's helping promote those chairs as well. You know, a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, that's what, right. Well, that's that's a, a good point. Plan, so. <laughs> Hey Mitch, what do you do about transporting your chairs? Just while we're talking about driving, let's let's talk about how do you need to transport your chairs, or do they live at yeah. live at where you play, or or how do you? Because they're they're fixed frames and they've got big cameras yeah. and they've got frames around them. How yeah. does that impact? How do you, how do you transport those? So I use a station wagon. Mm-hmm. Um, I pull the wheels off. They, they got a quick release so you can take the, the larger wheels off and then you, you're just down to your base frame mm-hmm. um normally that's all very fixed um especially on what what we've got at rgk um they're, they're normally a very fixed back for the lightweight they are very light so you can lift them up mm-hmm. with one arm and, and throw them in the back of the the car yep um but yeah throw it in the back of the car with the wheels and that's how i, I get it around yeah yeah right yeah well oh, just Interesting question. So you, uh, when you go, do you take both chairs, I'm assuming, one to get out of the car and then push your other one in from the boot of the yeah, car? Yeah, I wouldn't be getting the sports chair over my body to get into the car. That's, nah, um, no, that's no. good to go in the boot, yeah. Yep, and then you then you take both chairs in, um, pushing yeah, one so in front of your type of scenario. Man, yeah, get in the manual chair, uh, in my day chair, Yep. Um, and then pull the other chair out, put it together and, and push it in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So one... One, one last thing I wanted to ask. We had a um, politician on who's also ex-wheelchair basketballer, Lee Sultesh. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Lee Sultesh. Yeah, Lee yeah, and um, something she said was really interesting, and I wanted to see what you think about that and I guess how easy you think it is for people to access these sports. She was saying what she found was being around the sporting community made her, I guess, she was like wheelchair athletes all had like girlfriends and boyfriends and they all had like kind of standard lives. And so it was much easier for her to live this normal life within that kind of community. Um, and, and I guess, and then she was kind of encouraging people to try these sports because it's kind of like an instant, like ticks off all of these boxes for a disabled person within an instant, you know. Um, I guess, so what do you think about that and how easy is it for people to access things like NRL? and? Tennis? Yeah, so very easy to access um, a, lot of the, a lot of the sports through uh, your local, um, most, most states have a wheelchair sports. Um, organization uh, so you could go through them I think it's I think it's a great thing for mental health um, doing the sport uh, it, it gives it gives you it keeps your mind active thinking about something else rather than thinking about poor me um, I, I, I really really like sport and think it's it's wonderful it's been one of the best things for me since my accident um, the real wheelchair rugby league is starting to grow a bit it's, it's very big in sydney and it's getting bigger and bigger in queensland um or and, and canberra uh, it, we are trying to uh, still grow it a bit get it down into victoria 
um, and hopefully a bit further around Australia as well. Uh, just sort of following where the NRL is going is a, you know m- most of those places uh, big on the NRL. And what's the um, yeah. kind of like expectations around fitness of people and so on? So different grades. So you get, they've got entry level uh, right through to elite as well. So it doesn't matter what your fitness, if you've never played it before, it doesn't matter your capabilities. Uh, they've got those, those grassroots all the way through to elite. So and and is there, are the, are the teams graded like certain amount of points on the, on the floor? No. So uh, you can play with your able-bodied friends, which is... Oh, yeah. Uh, which is pretty cool. And it's all inclusive. There's, they're not graded. Um, only allowed two able bodies on the court at a time. That's the only only rule about grading, I suppose. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, really right. cool. Um, I mean, the thing is, is I actually, because I've seen a little bit of it and heard the stories, I reckon if there was a little bit of airtime on this wheelchair NRL, people would love it. Just seeing people throwing each other out of wheelchairs and things. like it's, Yeah, it's well, gonna, the- there's there's a there's a state of origin that happens and it was going to get a little bit um, more publicity this year uh, and then there's the rugby league wheelchair rugby league world cup which was going to happen but with all this COVID they've yeah. both been postponed and I well you were on the state year. of origin weren't you yes yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw that so that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah, I did yeah. some googling and I saw that you're on the team so. Uh... Oh well, congratulations, yeah. and fingers crossed for next year. Hopefully, it all opens back up again, and and that you can represent New South yeah. Wales and uh, take down the Maroons, and uh, then also hopefully you can uh, get to represent Australia as well. Mitch, yeah, I've done, um, that, done that once before, and hopefully I can do that again. Oh, congratulations! I and mean, what was that last question? What was that? What was that like representing Australia? Oh, it was incredible. It's it's um. Nothing more gives you more pride than representing your country. I think yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was amazing. The uh, Paralympics are on at the same time as we're uh, recording this, and uh, yeah, it's it's well, we, you you don't have the uh, murder ball rugby. Uh, you're not doing <laughs> that, but I, I'm assuming that it's somewhat as physical um, in the way that that you bang into each other, and I can see the pride that comes from representing Australia on the TV and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's an amazing uh, thing, and some of the stories that are coming out of the Paralympics right now at the, at the time of recording this uh, are amazing. And uh, yeah, I really thank you for coming on and, and sharing your story as well. Not a problem. Thanks for your time. We can't let you go though. We've got one yeah. more question, and we ask this of everybody. All right. <laughs> um, so we ask this of of everyone that comes on. What's something that you do in your car now that that you want to share with us. We know that cars are more than just getting to and from work or getting from A to B. There's a lot more meaning behind cars and getting in the car. What's something really special that you do in your car? Or maybe that's a little bit unusual that nobody else kind of knows about. What's, what's a car mean to you? Um, I'm, I've used it to, um, to sleep in. I've used it as accommodation uh, when I go <laughs> camping or that sort of thing. A bit easier than getting off the ground to get back into uh, into <laughs> into the chair. Yeah. Um, I do have a mate that likes to play tricks and he's very flexible and he has a sunroof in his car. So he drives around with his feet hanging out the roof. <laughs> oh. <laughs> has he got a, he's got a spinal cord injury, I'm assuming. He's got a spinal cord. I was in rehab with him and yeah, he, <laughs> and those hips are really flexible, yeah. Since since his accident he, he's able to flip his um, legs up around his ears and his <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, let's see. Again. It's, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, awesome. Well, I, I, I don't think we can top that, Ellie. What do you reckon? That's, that, great. that's that's the end of the interview. I reckon that's a great, uh, great thing, Mitch. Thanks very much for Thanks, uh, sharing that with us. Hey, uh, if Mitch, if people want to get in contact with you at Sunrise there, and they want to maybe ask about the RGK chairs or yep. get some advice about. Um, you know, those high-end lightweight chairs or want to know about wheelchair rugby or uh, uh, NRL, I should say. Um, is there a way that people could get in contact with you or, or can you set them up with where to go to get some information? Yeah, if they want to email me, it's um, mitchell.stone at sunrisemedical.com.au yep. um, or, or call Sunrise Medical and they'll be able to get you uh, through to me as well. Uh, yep, we'll, we'll put those discussion. details in the links below um, yep. the show anyway, so people can contact you guys. So. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you're wanting to know more about uh, the the NRL, uh, the wheelchair NRL, um, is it best just to get in contact with wheelchair sports in the local area? Uh, I think if you, oh, I can't remember what the um, 
website is. There is a website. It's, it's uh, NRL Wheelchair or Wheelchair. And I think it's NRL Wheelchair. Google will take you there. We'll find, it. It. We'll find it. it. We'll put a link down below. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that if one, you find it, send us a link. And that's got all the information on different states and everything in there. So if you do the NRL Wheelchair Australia, um, that will give you all the links for your, your local states. That's awesome. Awesome, mate. Um, well, when you get your new boat, let yep. us know how that goes and how you get in and out of it. And uh, we might be able to share that in the, in the show notes. Uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued on, on how you're going to, how you're going to do that and, and how you explore that whole getting in and out and how you actually buy a boat. So uh, I'd love to get you back on if you, if you're happy to talk about that element of driving and that uh, element of independence as well and unpack that a little bit more. But for today, I just want to say thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed today's conversation. So thanks. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mitch. Really, really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you soon. All right. And uh, for people tuning in, just hang around. Uh, after this little break, Ali and I are going to break down our top three of what we learned from, from Mitch's story. So we'll be back in a second. Welcome back, everybody. Um, a massive thank you to Mitch for joining us on, on this podcast. In this little section of the podcast, Ali and I break down our three takeaways from the interview and just reflect on some of the important things that we think are important to to reflect on to take away to learn from uh to move forward uh from this point in time ali what was your first takeaway from the interview yeah thanks brad first off um again thanks to mitch i thought that was a great interview i love um mitch's energy vibe attitude everything is just great he just moves through everything with i guess grace and also really genuine person looking after the community. Uh, yeah, as you said, the top three lessons. The first one um, I thought was really interesting with Mitch was he's very clearly a pretty big community player and he, te he tended to kind of integrate into that sort of disability community um, pretty easily and quickly. And that did yield him dividends uh, very positively, such as getting um, introduced to things like the wheelchair sports, the hand controls, the types of hand controls, you know, like we've spoken to people here that have had to start from scratch. How do I do it? What do I do? But he sort of got right into that community and from a fellow, um, you know, wheelchair person who might've had the same injury, started getting their experience and use their products. And so I thought that was really good, particularly as a follow-up from that Natalie Wade episode where there was kind of that mention of that introduction to this idea of this disability community and kind of bringing these people together and helping each other and, and, yeah. and that's a real big, I guess, yeah, sign that, that how beneficial that is. She said, and Natalie, just to reflect back on that one, was saying that uh, she was not protected from it, but stayed away from it until she became independent at the end of high school. But then she became integrated into it at the end of, uh, end of high school and, and really learnt more about herself at that point in time. And I, reflecting on that, number one, that integrated into the, into the cohort or, or to the to the people with similar issues. I found it really interesting how he reflected that he's not so sure about the independent rooms in the hospital. Yeah. And having somebody else in the room with you that you can share your deep and meaningfuls with and, and go through the same crap um, that comes with having a disability, a spinal cord injury and, and learning from each other where maybe now in independent rooms, that's not happening. And yeah. um and maybe there's there's something really to really something to learn from that and reflect on um, and listening to the people that are going through it um, about about what they're learning um, from from changes and I, I don't know I, I tend to agree with him maybe the hospitals have made a mistake in this area yeah um, yeah no I think that's interesting I mean they've probably done that because that seems to be just generally the way the community is moving you know more private and so on but um. But there is definitely, yeah. um, definitely he indicated that downside, which I thought was a, a big um, point. And he, I guess, attributed a lot of his success to just being in that room with the three other people. So that's a pretty big statement to make and a big impact for one little tiny thing that we might take for granted, you know. And, and often what might actually happen, I guess, to be honest, reflecting on my own personal journey of being in hospitals, Normally, it's my family that tells me they want, to meet, want me to be in a private room because they want to come in and visit and make noise and don't want to interrupt other people, right? 
Um, but they only come in for half an hour a day and then they go and then I'm there for the other 23 and a half hours on my own. So maybe it's better if I'm with other people. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's very, yeah, true. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, the uh, number two point that I um, want to then relate to is, is the support that he got from his, his family and his mates and um you know, we, we kind of washed over it a little bit because we concentrated on on the pressure sore that came from it and being prone for six months afterwards. But but even his mates taking him out for Christmas up to the Gold Coast and and getting him integrated into into the life outside a hospital really early um, and and being on the Gold Coast and, and flying up there and and meeting up there and so forth. But then also his mates, you know, the, the story of, leaving his wheelchair downstairs and then uh his mate saying no you left it downstairs you go get it um that's 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 what mates do that's three stories (laughs) three stories that's a lot that's a lot of stairs to be um yeah using your arms to get up and down those stairs that's yeah yeah uh, like that's uh, first of all it's great that he's got those supportive mates but Mm. one thing which I, i want to challenge the community out there is that um I think he's a big part of that. He's been open to accepting that support. What happens with, particularly with people that um, I see get into wheelchairs or have these accidents, it's natural, it's normal. We shut down from our friends. We feel like we're being an inconvenience. We can't do the same things as them. We're going to hold them back. They're going to hold us back. Whatever it is, we get all these negative thoughts that plague our mind. And then we go, no, we're not going to, I'm not going to come to the Gold Coast. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to hold you guys back. Um, but the thing is, is these guys have been your mates since you know forever so they're probably they want to help you you know they want to carry you up the stairs or or do that stuff so so the great thing is mitch has has allowed his friends to have that and um and and he's uh, he's been open to that rather than sort of shutting it out and that's a big big um kudos to him because it's paying dividends you know he's living on his own um playing sports doing all this stuff um, because he's been open to receiving that extra support that you know from the mates and the, and the people around him, and I think that's a big thing. It's not just those mates because I, I guess I'm generally pretty positive. I, I believe if you've got a, a group of five or ten mates around you, which most people do, um, those are your mates, no matter if you're in a chair or not or whatever. And and if you get if you get hurt, they're going to be there wanting to help you. So um, but you need to let them, and that's the difference, you know. Yeah. And, and I say that a little bit to myself because I'm a bit guilty of not letting people help me sometimes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it, it, that, that's what they want to do, you know. So. Yeah, I think you've summed it up really well there. Um, the, him him allowing them to to be part of his of his changed life, and I, I yeah, I think you've summed it up really well. The the last takeaway that I, I want to reflect on, and this is a bit one's a bit more of a technical one, is talking about his. I mean, there's so much to reflect on in regards to his boat and the hand controls that he's got and uh, making do with with his disability and making the most out of it. But from a technical point of view, I just want to talk about his wheelchair um, and loading his wheelchair in and out of his car. And um, he talked about how he's got a, a 4K, a four kilogram wheelchair that he's able to dismantle outside of the car, get over his body into the passenger seat, and he's able to do that and look after his shoulders because of the weight of his chair. And what I want to reflect on is, is how important it is to get the right prescription. And, 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 he, and he spoke about it and talking to experts is what you really need to do. But, you know, a four kilo chair is not going to be right for everybody. So don't, don't go out there and just buy a four kilo chair because it's easy to load across your body because it, it might be more tippy and it might be harder for you to control and it mightn't have the the same elements on the chair that what you need uh, to be able to stop pressure sores or but to be able to get in, a, in and around where you need to go on your on your on your commute in the in the chair you've really got to pick the chair that's right for you and and there's experts out there to do that yeah. and I, I, I I want to finish this off by giving a plug to to sun sunrise and also um mitch himself you know he's a product expert about the the rgk chairs um and and he he obviously knows his his products there and and i'm i want to say as a final reflection make sure that you talk to the to the experts that are out there and and make sure that you set yourself up with the trials and try these things out and and we say it about about cars but it's also about those wheelchairs as well 
Yeah, yeah. And and I um look to to build on that, we've mentioned that, you know, things like find a good OT, find a good modifier. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with the suppliers. Um, you need to find those ones that are the experts that know their shit, basically, because they need to help you. You know, um, it's not just the OT. It's not just the one person. Everyone's involved in this. And I guess, um, it, like, we, we've got no financial or any kind of um, thing to do yeah. with um, Sunrise. But, like, look, even speaking to Amy from their technical team, you can see that they seem to be very genuinely um, – I guess, trying to bring the right people onto the team that can genuinely help the community. Like Mitch knows his stuff inside out and he's the RGK, you know, light vehicles, lightweight specialist. So, um, and he's living and breathing it. So he can tell you exactly what works and what doesn't. And he's tried it. He's not going to be like some guy on the phone going, oh, well, I read this in a brochure. He did it. So that's that's pretty awesome that um, that, that company is putting that kind of effort um, and going out of their way to put these experts out there for you. And I guess it's not just a plug on that company. As we said, it's more of a plug on the experts yeah. um, and, and, and really find them, you know, but then they're out there, I guess, and Sunrise is doing a great job of recruiting them and putting them out there for us. Find the people that are invested, really, really invested in what they do. And I think that's, uh, he's invested, you know, he, he lives and breathes it. Sunrise as a company, live and breathe it, um, find the people that are invested in, in finding out the best for you. Um, and yeah, it's, it, uh, we've, we feel, Ali and I feel that it's the, the best way that you can get the, the most out of the products that are out there uh, because there's products and then there's products and there's a big difference between product A and product B and, and they can make a, a massive difference to your, to your life um, and, and making the most out of it. That's it. All That's right. It. And as you sort of mentioned before, and as we say in every episode, if you have any queries about what you can do and what will work for you, as we said, get in top, top, uh, contact with your local OT or mobility dealer, dealer and set yourself up with a trial. Trials really do put you in the driver's seat. Yeah. So and on this occasion, episode. on this occasion, talk to your wheelchair experts as well and set yourself up with a trial there. All right, Ellie. Thanks very much, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Drive Able podcast with Brad Williams and Ali Akbarian. If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate, and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share a story about driving with a disability, or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes, or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.